This program was paid for by Water of Life Church. From Water of Life Ministries in Plano, Texas, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is speaking through his servants to the world. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. Let us join Doyle Davidson and others of Water of Life, sowing the Word of God in spirit and in truth. Hello, I'm Doyle Davidson, servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, ministering locally to the body of Christ in Dallas of Fort Worth, Texas, sent by God to your house to declare unto you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God. Amen. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, tell us what the gospel is. How that Jesus Christ died by our sins, according to the scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scripture. Bring the Lord upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, and come a sight to the blind, so that liberty, them that are bruised. The word is not even in your heart and in your mouth. It is the word of faith which I preach. You'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Thank God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. I want to welcome everyone to this broadcast that's receiving it on live stream, Roku, Apple TV, YouTube. We'll be uh, recording television and shortwave in about 18 minutes or so. Join us in worshiping God. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, this is the day. 
Dancing is a charm and do it's hard. So I will sing, I will dance and do the love. Let's 
Oh, yeah. 
locally to the body of Christ in Dallas in Fort Worth, Texas, sent by God to your house to declare unto you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tell us what the gospel is. How that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to scripture. He was buried he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Thank God the spirit of the Lord is upon me as he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, set me to the broken heart, preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. Thank God. The word is not thee. If then your heart and your mouth, there's a word of faith which I preach you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved with the heart, man believeth, and the righteousness with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's a power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, the Jew verse, and also to the Greek. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written to just to live by his faith. I want to welcome everyone to viewing this on television, wherever you're at, and receiving it on shortwave, live stream, Roku, Apple Television, YouTube, other devices. Welcome to all of you. We're going to have a couple of songs of worship, and I will be back to speak to you. Amen. No.
it be the day. After I quit speaking, there'll be a song ministered by Paul Peters, Walk With Me, followed by Kathy Davidson preaching the milk of the gospel. You don't want to miss that one. Amen. But you don't want to miss this one either. Thank God. On the 29th of June, 2008, I was standing up on this platform speaking and out of my mouth came by the Spirit of God that my ancestors had come to America so I could preach the gospel. I was somewhat amazed. Somewhat amazed. I knew something about the Davidsons and I knew something about the Millers, my, my mother's side and my father's side being the natives. But I didn't know what I was soon to learn. In 09, 10, 11, God began to open up things to me that I knew nothing about. Thank God. First of all, one of the shockers, David Gasparite, who's been with me since 07. I bowed to me, a cousin. Not only did I find David to be a cousin, he's with me today, but he's a descendant of 16 of the Mayflower. And he's a descendant of, I don't know, maybe all eight of my great-grandfathers, but certainly a, a group of them, a large group. He's got a couple of his own, but we're cousins. Then I find Sadie Peters, the Senate of the Mayflower. But as I was speaking on the 29th of June, 2008, a lady walked up beside me. I'll never forget her. I knew her, but not well. I noticed she had on red shoes. And she starts talking about being a descendant of the Mayflower. And I didn't want to be rude and hope not to be now. But I thought, what are you doing up here? You're complicating this thing for me. Well, she didn't. Her name's Kathy Davidson. She'll be speaking after Paul Peters sings. So it was incredible what God revealed. But three weeks after June 29th, on July 20th, God did an amazing thing. An amazing thing. God had promised me years ago that I would bear that a son would come out of my loins. And that son would be like the one born in Isaiah chapter 8. Right. 
Isaiah and a prophetess. The prophetess does not have a name. It does not say that prophetess is this child's mother. No, it doesn't. Although that child, it refers that before that, father, that child can say, uh, my father or my mother, then judgment will begin. Also, I, I made just a brief error. It does not say that prophetess is Isaiah's wife. It does not say that. Paul Peters is getting ready to read to, me, to you Isaiah 8, and then I'm going to make some more comments. Isaiah 8, starting in verse 1. Moreover, the Lord said unto me, Take thee a great roll, and write in it with a man's pen concerning Maher Shalal Hashpaz. And I took unto me faithful witness to record Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jabrakiah. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the Lord shall have knowledge to cry, My father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. I made an error about not being his mother. Uh, what I meant was the prophetess did not, does not, need to be Isaiah. It wasn't Isaiah's wife. So, I know that a son will be born out of my loins. I've known it for years. And his name is John. I know that. Not John Davidson, John. That I know. I do not know who his mother is. And she will not be my wife. She is a prophetess. It's that simple. You may never know who that prophetess is. Oh, I will. I thought I'd give you a hint. I will. Unless God makes it known, you won't know. I'm quite sure you will see John. I'm, I'm quite sure you will. I do not know when or where John will be born. I do not know. I'm very methodical, thinking on my feet, which I can do well. I don't want to misstate something by the Spirit. The spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. And I know that. I know that well. Thank God. Now, in 13 January, Paul, you didn't know you would read this, Daniel 11, 20 through 28, when you get ready. All right. All right? Starting in verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a razor of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. Within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, ye also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the prophets. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand. For they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed are the portion of his meat shall destroy him, 
and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. My friends, when God revealed that to me, Kathy D was reading it to me. I was asking her to go to Daniel. She read it to me. And when I, she read 20 through 28, I said, my God, is this America? Is this the United States of America? The land that I love. Could this be the United States of America prophesied by the prophet Daniel about what would happen at the end? It's taken me time to settle, but I'm convinced this is the United States of America. I'm convinced the president we have now is found beginning in verse 20. Now, there's another one coming up. Coming up, elected in November, or certainly be put in place the 20th or inauguration day in January 17th. Not saying anything certain. I did, and I just retracted it. My friends, this, these days are frightening. A few months back, I said to the Lord, what will 16 look like? The Lord gave me a word. Paul, go to 1 Thessalonians. Do you have the NIV? I can pull it up. Pull it up. NIV, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, I'm going to tell you the word that God told me would be 16 in America. Unsettled. I said, Katie, look us up. King James, not there. I said, look at that NIV. Paul, can you see the word? You just want me to start in verse 1? In chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1? Yeah, go until you find unsettled. Okay. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us, of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. Then how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Three, three. What? Chapter 3, verse 3. Oh, to what? No, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. Did you hear that? I'm sorry. Yes. I'll start in verse 1. So that we could stand it no longer... We thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, and spreading the gospel of Christ, 
to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one will be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. There's a word. Is it 2 Thessalonians 2? Right. Chapter 2? 2-2, two, two, right. 2-2, two, two. okay. Read that. 2 Thessalonians, okay. 2 Thessalonians. 2. 2. Verse 2. Not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by a word of mouth or by a letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. You can read those two accounts. But I knew God gave me the word unsettled by the Spirit. One day in King James, I said, look at NIV. There it was. I'm just telling you, America is unsettled. If you don't know it, you're blind. In four months, about four, I guess, there's going to be a little over. There'll be an election. Maybe. Maybe. We don't know. We don't know what's going on in our country. We don't know. Unsettled times, folks. Now, I'm convinced that John, my son, will be born. And before he can say my father and my mother, Judgment begins. I'm not sure of that judgment at all. I've got some perception, perhaps, that I know, but I'm not ready to say it. It's not clear enough in my spirit to say it. You see, God puts words in my spirit, but it's not yet time to deliver. And the faith and the love have to be developed before you can speak. In the book of Galatians, chapter 5, it says, not, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith which worketh by love. That's how I live. But I'm telling you now, America, you're going to see more unsettled days. Unsettled days ahead. You better repent and believe my gospel. Most certainly, they're coming. I do not know when the prophetess will conceive. I do not know the mother of John. I do not know I no not say any more. All right, thank God. But I would encourage you to consider what I'm saying and watch and let God give you understanding. Why don't we have a song by Paul Peters the other day that is going to preach the milk or any time left, we'll worship God. What do you say? with me, walk with me, lest mine eyes no longer see all the glory, all the story of your love. Talk to me, talk to me, like you did so tender. Sure. 
over and over and over and over again. And what he found in Romans was it was completely contradictory to the religion that he belonged to. And he stepped out of his room and he hung a note on the door and he said, justification by faith. And he did something also that was extremely prohibited at the time. He took the word of God and he translated it into a language that the common man could read. And that was German. And the man's name was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, with that little note on the door, changed the world. And that Bible was put in the hands of a common man, was also translated into English. And there was a group of people that started reading it and said, wait a minute. We're not following what this book says. We've got to follow what this book says. You know what? They were the pilgrims. Fourteen generations ago, my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, William Brewster, was a religious leader and preached that word. And he came to the United States, only it was America at the time, and he parked the group in Plymouth, Mayflower, the pilgrims. And you know why they came? Because they could read. Because they could read. Do you know how blessed we are that we have the book that we can read it? Do you know how blessed you are that you have the Word of God available to you readily? Now, I'm going to ask you, do you have the courage to read it? Do you have the courage to read it like they did? You know, some of them read it and they ended up dead. They were killed for reading it. Do you have the courage to read what's in this book? I'm going to read some things to you today that might just shake you up a little bit. So... Buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. I want you to go with me to John 3. I've read this over and over again. Yes, I love it. I preach the gospel. No other message. I preach the gospel. Now, this is a marvelous, marvelous statement, a marvelous chapter, and we don't realize how important this chapter is. I'm going to begin in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. You know, Paul said in Acts that the Pharisees were the strictest sect of their law, the straightest, the most straightest. Pharisees, serious people about the law. Nicodemus was a ruler of those Pharisees. 
So Nicodemus was a man that followed the law. Uh, the sect of the Pharisees, strict, a strict follower of the law. And what does the strict follower of the law do? He goes and sees Jesus. He goes and sees Jesus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, because no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Think about that for a second. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a Pharisee, following the law strictly, strictly, according to the law, this man had it made. What does this Nicodemus do? He goes by night and sees Jesus. He goes to Jesus. This man that was heavy into the law, strict in the law, followed the Ten Commandments, followed all the ordinances. By night, he goes and sees Jesus. Why is he going to see Jesus? Because he realizes Jesus can do something he cannot do. He realizes this Pharisee, this follower of the law, realizes Jesus can do something he cannot do. Do you realize how important this meeting is? This is the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the law, the Ten Commandments, and Jesus. Two different people. And the Pharisee wants to know about Jesus, how he can do the things he can't do. And this is what Jesus tells him. Verse 2, the, the same came by Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered him and said, Jesus is talking to a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee, a man strict in the law. And what does Jesus tell him? You're doing a good job following that law. Is that what Jesus said? Look at your Bible. What does Jesus tell him? Oh, you're doing a good job following that law, Nicodemus. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't even talk about the law. What does Jesus say? He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, Nicodemus, you rule of the Jews, you that follow the Ten Commandments, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What was the Pharisee looking for? The miracles that Jesus did. What were the miracles that Jesus did? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes with power. He was doing the kingdom of God. Jesus walking in the kingdom. Miracles, signs, wonders, healings. Nicodemus sees he doesn't have that. So what does Jesus tell him? You must be born again or you can't even see the kingdom. He says that to a man following the Ten Commandments. Do you see that? Do you see that? Jesus tells a man that walks in the Ten Commandments, you must be born again. Do you hear that? Are you following the Ten Commandments? What does Jesus say to you? You must be born again. You must be born again. Not the Ten Commandments. You must be born again. That's what Jesus tells Nicodemus. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom. You cannot see the miracles. You cannot have God leading you unless you are born again. And you know what this says right here? The Ten Commandments isn't going to get it for you. The Ten Commandments is not going to get it for you. Turn with me to Hebrews 7. This is a marvelous scripture. I want you to go to verse 11, and I want you to look at it. Do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to look at the Word of God and not what your Sunday school teacher says? Do you have the courage to look at the Word of God that was given to us 500 years ago in a language we can read? 
by God. Who sent Luther into that room? God did. He said, it's time. It's time that we read. Now, can you read? Can you read? You know, I used to be a reading teacher, a reading specialist. Can you read? Can you read simple words on a page and believe them? Verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. So if the law made you perfect is what it's saying. Does the Ten Commandments make you perfect? Let's read. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise? Another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, uh, out of the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. It says, for the priesthood being changed. Do you see that? The priesthood being changed. Are you following Aaron and the law? Who's your priest? You've got to make a decision. You know what's interesting? In the Old and New Testament, you can't walk in the middle. Who is your priest? Is Aaron your priest or is Jesus your priest? You know, if Jesus is your priest, you can't follow the law. Let's read on. It says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need? Was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron for the priesthood being changed? The priesthood was changed. Do you hear that? There was a necess- it, There is made of necessity a change of the law also. If the priesthood changed, the law had to change. Do you see that? The law had to change. The Ten Commandments had to change. And what did they change into? For he of whom these things are spoken of pertained to another tribe, of which no man giveth attendance at the altar. For it is evident, it is evident, our Lord Jesus sprang out of Judah. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. He wasn't a priest under the law. Do you see that? Jesus is not a priest under the law. He can't be. Jesus is not a priest under the law. He can't be. He's from Judah. He's from Judah. Who's your priest? It says, for it is evident our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest who is made not after uh, after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, God testified to Jesus, thou art a priest forever, forever, out of the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron. Jesus cannot be a priest of the law. He is not a Levi. He's from Judah. Jesus is from Judah. He said, for there is very a disannoying of the commandment gone before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Read that again. 17, for he testifieth to Jesus. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For it is therefore there is verily a disannoying of the commandment, the law, going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. The law was weak and it was unprofitable. Who is your priest? Who is your priest? It says here the law was weak and unprofitable. Look at the next verse. For the law made nothing perfect. Can you read that? You that follow the Ten Commandments, you that say you believe the Word of God, can you read? 
Can you read simple fifth grade words? Verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. Did. The bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. And as much as not without an oath, Jesus was made priest, a priest. For those priests were made without an oath. But he that said unto him, The Lord swore and will not repent to Jesus. Thou art a priest forever. Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, a better one, a better testament. Not the Old Testament, the New Testament, a better testament. Do you hear that? A better testament. The New Testament, the New Covenant is better better. Why do you want to be under the Ten Commandments when you can be under something that is so much better? So much better. It says, and they, um, 23, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, this priest, Jesus, is Jesus your priest? It says, wherefore he is also able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, because he ever liveth to make intercession for him. Who is your priest? Who is your priest? Jesus cannot be a priest of the law. He is not a Levi. He is from Judah. He is from Judah. God made him a priest as Melchizedek, an unchangeable priesthood. Turn with me to Galatians 2, verse 16. It says, knowing this, and this is Paul preaching to the Galatians. The Galatians were Gentiles. They were not Jews. He preached the gospel to, the, to Galatia, preached them the gospel. They were doing just great in the gospel. And then you know what they started doing? They started following the law. And they got themselves in a mess. So Paul had to straighten them out. And what's he do? Chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law. Can you read that? Knowing a man is not justified by the works of the law. Thou shalt not, will not justify you. It will not take your sins away. It will not take the thing out of you that wants to commit the sin. It will not justify you. What justifies you? Continue reading. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but, but, I know I got some kids that love when I say that word, but, do you see how it splits the two apart? But by the faith of Jesus Christ, by the faith of Jesus Christ, how are you justified? How are your sins taken away? How is that thing in you? How are you delivered from the things in you that make you sin? By faith in Jesus. By faith in Jesus. By faith in the gospel. By the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You cannot walk in the Ten Commandments and be justified. What do you do? You have faith in the gospel. You walk in the gospel. You walk in the gospel. I hear some of you right now and you're screaming. Matthew, turn with me to Matthew 5. Verse 18, Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the wall till all be fulfilled. That verse is in there, absolutely. 
For verily I say unto you, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Turn with me to Romans 8, verse 4. For Christ, for Jesus, for Christ is the end of the law. For righteousness to who? To everyone that believes. Christ is the end of the law. If you look that up in NIV, it says culmination of the law, the fulfillment of the law. The law was fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus said not one totter, tot, jot or tittle will fail until it's all fulfilled. Romans says for Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus fulfilled it. How do we fulfill it? We walk in Jesus. We walk in the gospel. The condemnation won't be there when you walk in the gospel. You don't, you, I can hear you now. You're saying, what? We're not, we're, we're not supposed to follow the Ten Commandments. We're, not, we're supposed to lie. We're going to cheat. We're going we're gonna to commit adultery. Oops, sorry. Turn with me to Romans 8. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. God. That's what the gospel brought us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Do you know when you walk in the Spirit, you won't sin? Do you know when you walk in that gospel, you won't sin? Do you know when you walk in the faith of the blood of Jesus, you can't sin? You can't. You'll start to move and that Holy Spirit will go, go over here. That Holy Spirit is your guide. It'll keep you from sinning. It'll, it'll wash you in the blood. It'll walk you through the word. It'll fill you with the word. And you know what that gospel does? It'll make you perfect. Amen. When you are walking in the spirit, you cannot sin. Amen. It won't be in you. You've been baptized in water. That part of you that wants to sin was put to death. It was put to death. You don't follow the Ten Commandments. Who's your priest? Who is your priest? Jesus is the end of the Ten Commandments for you that believe. That believe. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And when you walk in Jesus and you walk in that Holy Ghost, you will fulfill the law and you will be justified and you will be redeemed from the things that make you want to do those things, that sin. You will be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Jesus is your priest and he lives forever to intercede for you so that you don't sin. Do you see the difference? Do you see you are not to walk in the Ten Commandments? You are to walk in the Spirit of God. And Jesus said that to Nicodemus. Nicodemus walked in the Ten Commandments. And what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. Who was the, who was the man that brought in the uh, the, the new covenant, Jesus did. And how did he bring in the new, cut the new covenant? By a better sacrifice. And what was that sacrifice? It was his own body. Jesus brought in the New Testament by a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was his own body. And that body of his bore your sin. And he bore your pain, and he bore your sickness, and he bore your peace, and he bore your poverty, and he paid for your sin for the Father to bring you back to him so that you could have a new high priest, one that would make you perfect one that would walk with you and lead you and bring you into the land, the land of prosperity, the land of justification, the land of no sickness, the land of walking with God and talking with God. That's what Jesus brought in. Now, who is your priest? You want Jesus to be your priest? Then you must be born again. You lay down the law and you pick up Jesus. And how do you do that? Turn with me to Romans 10. Verse 9, 
It said that thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Jesus be Lord. Jesus, you're my priest. If thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be born again. Amen. We invite you to visit Water of Life Church at 1621 18th Street in Plano, Texas. Or for further information, call area code 972-578-8082. That's 972-578-8082. Or write Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. That's Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. This program was paid for by Water of Life Church.